Hello, I'm Greg Williams, and first let me say happy Valentine's Day and weekend to everyone. I feel led, and so I'm going to follow through in a bit of a different direction today, but we'll circle back around to tell you more about Valentine's Day and why it is not only truly worth celebrating, but maybe even now more than ever. Here's my title, Valentine, Marriage, and family privilege. I do the quote marks because it's on the title. It's in the newsletter too. If you want to look on, the, read it on the, the website. You know, Saint Valentine is celebrated in our day and time in our culture, at least in America, basically, for romance, love, and sex. And basically, we've made all three of those the same, and we've discarded actually what he stood for. You see, those three things are only part of the story. His work should be celebrated because he stood for God's institution of marriage. And we, as his church, as his people, must take up his mantle in this day and time. Let me just give you five reasons. I'm not going to elaborate on them. I'm just going to give you five, but you'll hear these throughout. Five reasons why Valentine's Day and marriage, what he stood for, are good for you. Number one, they're good for your spouse. Number two, they're good for you. Valentine's Day and marriage doesn't mean everybody has to get married, but it has a significant impact on our lives and our culture through our marriage and our families. Number three, it's good for your family. Number four, it's good for Christ's church. And five, and last, it's good for our culture. You see, if we're not on the right foundation for our culture and our society, and marriage in God's design is that foundation. It's where he started in Genesis 1 and 2. Then very seldom, if ever, will we have the change of heart that can make the difference in relationships and especially in marriage, in our families, in the church, and in the culture. And we're seeing that today. Let me give you a brief look at the state of our unions, okay? You know what I'm talking about there. And the influence or lack thereof that we as Christ's people in the churches have had on our culture over the past 60 plus years. This has to change. And I believe God is calling us to stand up for, he's calling us to, and asking us to live out this change. Since 1960, America has witnessed a 12-fold 1,200% increase in cohabitation and a 50% plunge in the marriage rate. Our way or God's way? That's really what it comes down to. About 45% of cohabiting couples undergo what is called premarital divorce. Mike McManus of Marriage Savers calls that mini, M-I-N-I, -I, divorces. And the pain is every bit as bad as the real thing within marriage. Because the way God designed us, we'll get into this more when we get into sex later on down the road, but God designed us to bond to everyone we have sex with. Imagine what you do when you do that over and over again. So the breakups in cohabitation are every bit as painful as tough in most cases as they are in a marriage. That's why Mike McMahon has called them many divorces. The half who do make it to the altar are 50%, approximately 50% more likely to divorce, to divorce than those who lived apart prior to marrying. About 70 to 80% of them end in divorce, which ends up with about 15, as few as 15 out of every 100 cohabiting couples go on to create a lasting marriage. So it's actually more a pretest for divorce, a pre-divorce trial, than it is a pre-marriage trial. The statistics bear that out. Let me tell you something. That's just the tip of the iceberg. None of this speaks specifically to the overwhelming inundation of pornography and pornea, and that is sexual immorality, which biblically speaking, and that's what we base our, our conversations and our messages on, is any sex outside of one man, one woman marriage. That's pornea. That's sexual immorality. And it is rampant and accepted in our culture and even in many of our churches by admission or teaching or by omission or not teaching about it. 
It is found in every form of media and social media with little resistance. It is codified in our laws to endorse and promote sexual immorality and demean and diminish marriage and family according to God's design. And it is literally disguised, porn that is, is disguised as education and taught to school children of every age. And for the most part, the church and believers sit back and go, oh, well, it's okay. Look around, folks. Look around. So where do we find ourselves on this Valentine's Day weekend? Let's look at the game plan of the socialists and the liberals who know, and they do know this, and I'm going to give you a quote to tell you why, where a lot of this comes from, who know they must destroy or diminish God's design for marriage and family in order to bring about government control. The playbook could be entitled, and you heard this in my original title here this or earlier, Family Privilege. Sounds great, until you dig just beneath the surface. The premise is rooted, as are many things today, in faulty reasoning of tolerance and discrimination leveled, in this case, against the privileging of certain family types and structures as better than others. Even though the overwhelming social science research and data clearly tells a different story. There is a major positive difference in families with male and female marriage with biological or adopted children. The positives overwhelmingly outrank the negatives and they far exceed the health and well-being and adaptability of every other so-called family. The family privilege people, they're convoluted and ideological. There is no science to back it up. They pull out little pieces and piece it together and say, look at this science, but it never holds up. That's why they have to silence or censor or cancel those who do bring the truth of the science with them. Their ideological argument seems to be that by giving special respect to one kind of relationship over others, we simultaneously disrespect all other relationships. It's not the case. We're just stating the reality. The stated goal is to foster greater social inclusion and advancement for all people. And that, in and of itself, can be noble. We want people to do well. The problem is when you take away a husband and a wife and a mother and a father from a family, it's proven overwhelmingly over and over again that most of those kids struggle. And the school system and the government and media can't make up for that. Sorry, the government would love to. That's why they have to do this. There's your government control. Marriage, however, and all of its wonderful and proven benefits, even during the struggles and trials. I, don't, don't let me give you just a, this is so great and everything's wonderful. Marriage, with all its wonderful and proven benefits, even in the midst of the trials and struggles, struggles and the work involved, will cease to exist in any recognizable form if family privilege, I'll get my quotes in again, concepts and constructs prevail. And that literally is the deeper goal of those who are pushing this ideological agenda. Check out their old, old playbook. Don't let this scare you. Listen to this. Vladimir Lenin. You ever heard of him? Likely not, because he's been raised up in many courses today in history as a hero. But he was the architect of the Soviet Union, communist Soviet Union. He stated, and this sounds hauntingly familiar, listen to this quote, direct quote. Corrupt the young, get them away from religion, get them interested in sex, make them superficial, destroy their ruggedness, their ability to handle circumstances, that's what he's saying there, get control of all means of publicity. Are we canceling things now? We're doing it, however, only with certain agreement. Get control of all publicity and thereby get the people's mind off their government by focusing their attention on athletics, sexy books and plays, media, arts, entertainment, and trivialities. Divide the people into hostile groups by constantly harping on controversial matters of little or no importance. Destroy the people's faith in their natural leaders by holding up the ladder to ridicule, contempt, and obloquy. 
which means just a mess, okay? But they, they don't know how to do anything. It's a mess. Always pre preach true democracy, the will of the people, but seize power as fast and as ruthlessly as possible. Encourage government extravagance, welfare, everything else that goes with that, without holding people accountable. Destroy its credit, $25 million, trillion dollars in debt now, credit's sinking, okay? Produce fear with rising prices, inflation, and general discontent. Foment unnecessary strikes in vital industries. Listen to this one. Encourage civil disorders and foster a soft and lenient attitude on the part of government toward such disorders. By specious argument, cause the breakdown of the old moral virtues, honesty, sobriety, continence, faith in the pledged word, ruggedness, there's that word again, that we sorely miss in our culture today, cause the registration of all firearms on some pretext with the view of confiscating them and leaving the population defenseless. That's the playbook, folks. And they take it right into family privilege. All of us have to be equal. Problem is, you can't make someone equal and they don't have that love in their family. We can love them and we can help them through Christ. That's the only way you're going to do it. Government can't do that. Social media, education, Movies and songs and videos can't do that. As a matter of fact, most of them feed the playbook. With regard to marriage and family, Lenin went on to say, destroy the family, you destroy the country, it's, which is exactly what he did and then tyrannically reordered it as the Communist Soviet Union. We're in the throes of that right now. Ultimately, we see this in our country through our media, education, and government with those who agree that all relationship style, lifestyle choices are equal or better than those who uphold one man and one woman marriage and traditional family. If you say all of them are equal, we're going to invite you in. If you say that traditional marriage and family is better, which all the science points to, you don't belong. That's what they're doing. They claim the moral high ground, and then listen to this, shout down, censor, silence, or cancel anyone who disagrees. It's the only way to attain what they are after as research and reality clearly shows a different picture. If this sounds vaguely familiar, and I'm sure it does, it's because we look no further than the BLM and related movements that hide behind racial and other injustices, which we do need to rightfully pay attention to, but they're actually promoting these very ideals that I'm sharing with you here, the destruction of the nuclear family so they can reap control through government and media and education. As believers in Christ, we must boldly, truthfully, and graciously come against this agenda for destroying the nuclear family according to God's design and covenant order. We must stand firm in the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10-18, and I'm going to post that. That you go and look at it and see daily if you're standing in that truth, righteousness, shoes of the gospel of peace, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. That's the only way we'll be able to continue to shine his light and share his love. I've got a whole article on this family privilege that I'm linking in the comments, okay? You can read more on it. Now, here's some food for thought about how we might turn the corner in line with what I just said about the gospel armor. Ross Douthat, who's actually the religion writer or editor in the New York Times, or he used to be, I think he still is, I believe he still is, he describes our culture's loss of religion, familial or family breakdown, and plummeting birth rates as a set of feedback loops. Listen to this and see if it applies. The rich society creates incentives to set aside faith faith's admonitions, which orients the culture more toward immediate material pleasures, which makes its inhabitants less likely to have children, which we, and all these things are true in our culture, by the way, which weakens the communal transmission, communal, familial, relational, loving transmission belt for religious traditions, which pushes the society further along the materialist, individualist path, and at a certain point you end up, well, here, with unparalleled prosperity joined to seemingly irresistible 
demographic decline. He goes on to say, how can we escape this vicious cycle? This is powerful, okay? Perhaps, writes Douthat, this would require our society to become dramatically unlike itself. That is self. Where have we heard that before? Order to sacrifice rather than consumption, be a living sacrifice, okay? Rather than consumption, what do I get out of it? And order to eternity rather than what remains of the American dream. You would not need change on the margins, but wholehearted transformation, probably religious transformation at the heart. Wow. Which brings me back around to St. Valentine's Day. How's that? St. Valentine, Valentine and his day. You see, the legend of St. Valentine's, I shared this a couple years ago, which is why I didn't want to just stay on this, and we've got so much more we need to, to think about and work through. The legend of St. Valentine's is much more about the commitment to the covenant of marriage than it is to romance and sex. Both are important, but Valentine was not martyred for peddling romance and sex. He was martyred for standing up for God's design for marriage against a government and a Roman emperor who outlawed marriage thinking that single men would fight more for their country. They found out through time and through life that men would actually fight more for a wife and a family within that country than just for king and country itself. Valentine ultimately gave his life for the sake of marriage. Sadly enough, as with most things today, we've made it all about romance and sex and a false kind of love. You see, marriage is God's awesome design for love, oneness, romance, and sex. That's where it belongs. That's where it's blessed. That's where our children are blessed. That's where the culture can be blessed. Our churches can be blessed. It is awesome. It's not easy. And it does take work, contrary to the fairy tale and pornified cultural messages that inundate us. You're going to see Genesis 127, 224, and 25, and Hebrews 13, 4 linked in the comments as well. Check them out and see what God's, how God designed marriage and what he says about it, how we ought to honor it. They all tell us that God's design and desire is for marriage, and it's the beginning foundation. Male and female, husband and wife, in a lifelong covenant commitment that is to be honored by all. You see, when we honor marriage, it means that we honor all relationships, ours and others, before we're married, during, and after, according to that covenant order and design that God laid out for us. St. Valentine and his day are really about marriage much more than romance. But don't miss the romance. It's good. It's good in dating. It's good within marriage. But keep all the other things where they belong, and you'll be blessed. You see, you focus on romance only and sex, and both will fail. Focus on marriage, commitment, and covenant while working on romance. Yes, I did say working on it. Yeah, it doesn't come naturally, and both will flourish. Marriage is one of God's most precious and incredible gifts given to humankind in order for family, community, his church, and nations to flourish. And we risk all of those when we toss marriage to the curb. St. Valentine, romance, and marriage, it's not about family privilege. If we elevate and give marriage, your marriage, and all relationships the honor that God's word ascribes to it, Valentine was willing to give his life for it. Maybe he was on to something. Who's going to stand with me as a modern-day Valentine against the lies and deceptions of of media, education, and government, and stand for marriage, family, and romance, and even sex. It's awesome, okay? In line with God's truth, so we can leave a better legacy than what was left to us. Let me give you a little food for thought as we close out and then some action items. God's design for marriage, excuse me, calls us as believers to honor marriage, not just when we say I do, but long before with purity and integrity in every relationship that carries over into our marriage and blesses our family, blesses the union and blesses our family. That's how communities and churches and states and nations become blessed. In Christ, 
in through marriage. Even those who don't get married, and that's okay, are blessed if they walk in that honor. Let me give you four action items, okay? Take time to reflect on God's design for marriage, relationships, and sexuality. What does that say to you? And I've got these linked, but I'm going to read them to you. Genesis 127. So God created man, mankind, in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Each one of us is created in God's image, but he created us together for a purpose in his image. And then he goes on in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25 of Genesis to tell us why. That is why, for this reason, okay, one translation says, this is the reason that he created a male and female in his image, that a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife, is united, becomes one flesh. That's a direct reference to the sexual union within marriage. You become one in many other ways, but it's a direct reference here to the oneness. And God designed us with hormones and physiologically and physically to, to become one with one person. We've made mistakes. We've sinned. I've already admitted that. But we're forgiven. Let's go back and do it his way and reap his blessings. Adam and his wife, verse 25, were both naked and they felt no shame. My friends, uh, well, my acquaintances, I know them a little bit. They used to be at Northeast Christian Church here in Lexington and now are with XO Marriage uh, and Marriage Today with uh, uh, Evans. Jimmy Evans, Jimmy and Carrie and Evans do, do marriage today. And Ashley and Dave Willis have a book now called Naked Marriage. You ought to check it out. It's good stuff, okay? Finally, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all, remember, married or not, all. And the marriage bed kept pure before you're married, during your marriage, after your marriage. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. And yet, what are we doing in our culture? We're glorifying that. We're glorifying the pornea. We're trying to destroy marriage and family. Number two, I know that was a long one. I wanted to read those scriptures to you. But remember, reflect on God's design for marriage, relationship, and sexuality. What's he saying to you? Number two, ask the Holy Spirit to show you how this impacts your marriage and your spouse or your future marriage and spouse. Okay? Number three, ask the Father to reveal his will for your relationships, your present and your future relationships marriage or spouse however that applies to you reveal your will for my relationships presently in marriage future marriage whatever that may be how am i walking and honoring it by following your will and finally number four read the article that i'm going to link in the comments it's entitled the valentine's day gift that keeps on giving it's by gary thomas who wrote sacred marriage sacred parenting a great author, great pastor, but he wrote this article, The Valentine's Day Gift That Keeps on Giving. Don't we all want that? Absolutely. Check it out. It helps pull together all of this for a wonderful Valentine's Day that will continue each and every day. All right? Also, I've got some great videos and songs linked in the comments for you to enjoy individually or together. Now, if you need help in any of this, your walk with the Lord you're walking your marriage with your family, give us a call. Contact us. You can contact myself, 859-229-6504, 859-229-6504, or loveandlordship at gmail.com, loveandlordship at gmail.com. I'm not doing any mentoring minute because I think I've said enough today. We'll bring that back next week, Lord willing. Thank you for being with us. Let us know what you think, your comments, uh, your questions. We'd love to interact with you on that. Now, we, we're, in, uh, we're in the middle of year-end and mid-year fundraising, so I don't belabor this much. Ask the Lord if he's using this to impact you, and if he desires that you give to us, then follow through in obedience and let him bless you. If not, ask him until he shows you where you want, to, he wants you to give, and then follow through. I promise you, I promise you, it will be a blessing, however you choose, if you will follow him in that. Love and Lordship is here to help you, and I hope you can tell this, to live joyfully, and have healthy and fulfilling relationships in the love and worship of Jesus Christ. We don't charge for any of this, so call us, text us, email us, whatever you need. We'd love to be in touch with you to help you out with that. If your church or a group or an organization would like to hear from love and worship, we'd love to get together with you and share some of this. And with the book, hopefully, the next couple of days, we're going to have a print version ready again. It's going to be a good one. Please pray. 
please pray. Thank you for that. But if your group or organization or church would like to partner with us, email, text, or call me. Please. The numbers are there. I've got them in the comments as well. We desire to make disciples who make disciples in every home and church in His love and Lordship. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for your prayers. Thanks always to the Lord. Make it a great day, a Valentine's Day weekend, and God bless in Christ.